All right, Applying God's Word, a, a new series that we wanted to do. I wanted to do it because basically sometimes between a sermon on Sunday and a Bible study, maybe a ladies' Bible study on a Friday, ours on a Wednesday, you know, sometimes once or twice a week, you've got things to kind of meditate on during to the rest of the week. Sometimes it's not easy for you to pick up your scripture and read. Let me encourage you to do it. Because God needs that really solid word to bring up out of us and also to help us reason with our mind. Because our mind can go off sometimes. Woo! Hello. Of course, yours doesn't. Amen. All right. So, knowing a tree by the fruit. Knowing the tree by its fruit. That's our, our uh, subtitle for tonight. Applying God's word. So, in this lesson, we'll point out the how to know a tree by the fruit it bears. We don't curse a tree. Jesus did that for an example. Do you know why he cursed the fig tree? Can anybody tell me? Would you like to know the answer? The fig tree represented Israel. And Israel was supposed to bear fruit. And the fruit they were supposed to bear is to bring forth a gospel saying the Messiah is coming. Look for the Messiah. But instead, they preach the law. And the law says, no matter how good you are, thou shall not. And remember when you told your children, thou shall not. One of the temptations they might have had was, I'm going to do it when you're not around. Hello, I, are you with me? So we can identify with that. So let's go on. It says, there is a lot to say about fruit, how God is glorified in fruit, how he desires for us to bear much fruit. You and I to walk worthy of the calling to which God gave us. If we're a father, tell a father calling. If we are a teacher, a teacher's calling. If we're maybe, um, I don't know, maybe we are a leader of a business, then that business calling. Maybe you're a pastor. You have a pastor's calling. But we're to walk worthy of that calling. In other words, walk by the Spirit in that calling and not blow it so many times people go, ooh, I don't want to be one of them. We're supposed to be a good witness. Can you say amen? Because we're surrounded with such a great a cloud of witnesses. Let's go on and read our paragraph. All right, so each one of us has a place and a calling within God. We are stewards of what God gave us. Amen? We are to take them Seriously, the very things that God assigns us, we're to take it seriously. I take pastoring seriously. I want to be a better pastor week by week. I want to be a better minister of the word. One of my prayers to God is, Lord, that I can share the word of God in such a way it reveals things to the hearer and that the words don't fall to the ground, but will accomplish the very thing that they are designed to accomplish in our hearts. Amen. On good ground. That's what I desire to do. Amen. So God, again, we're, we're to be serious over what God gives us. Now, the flock of God is just that. It belongs to God. When we walk in the midst of each other, we are to build each other up. We are to encourage one another to give hope and faith. Making some of ourselves... Um, we need to be encouraging one another to be also rooted and grounded in love. So be watchful that you don't trample on the tender plants that come into a church. These are the new believers. And so the new believers need to be handled with grace. Amen? A church, God showed me a long time ago, are kind of like a drinking uh, waters, like an artesian water. And you don't want people going in stirring up the mud. Can you say Amen. All right, so be watchful. You don't trample under the tender plants or stir up the waters where those who need to drink can't because of the mud and all the junk stirred up from the bottom. There's a lot more to ministry sometimes than we think. Even in a Bible study, you want to make sure that the word that you minister doesn't tear down but builds up. Someone say amen. All right, so if you open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11, we're going to look at first two verses, verse 1 and verse 2, as our opening text. It 
So look, and there's this wonderful little glass. Reminds me of the art in search of the lost ark, or what is it? Uh, Holy Grail. And the guy chooses the right one. He says, you've chosen correctly. Amen. And that's what it reminds me of. All right. Isaiah 11. Listen to what it says. Okay. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Everyone say amen. So under your points there, follow along with me. The rod from the stem of Jesse is David. Didn't Jesus come from the line of David? Sure he did. Amen. Amen. And that's what he's prophesying. The rod from the stem of Je uh, Jesse is David. Okay. And the branch shall grow out of his root. Who's that? Who's, who's the branch that grows out of David's root? Jesus. Can you say amen? And then you'll understand why it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Are you with me? Second point. He is the vine and we are the what? Amen. So this is what we call an analogy. Okay. A type and shadow for us to realize. And when Jesus spoke this, this is before he died and rose again. So this is Old Testament analogy. But we're going to bring it when we study it tonight. We're going to bring it into the New Testament. Okay. And give you the God in you interpretation. Okay, uh, so point two, he is the vine and we are the branches. If we have Christ Jesus in our hearts, we are grafted into Christ in God. Can you say amen? Our fruit is now good as we walk with Christ. Third point is we are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, it says in Isaiah. And here it is, Isaiah 61 Verse 3 and 4. If you have your Bible, read along. To console those who mourn in Zion. Now Zion is, because we have a lot of new people on these Bible studies. Zion is a spiritual sense of being seated with God in heavenly places. Remember, the Old Testament, they came to Mount Sinai with thunderings and where the law was given. And no one could even touch the mountain unless the spirit was drove through them. See, fear and, and intimidation. But we have not come to Mount Zion. We've come, excuse me, Mount, Mount um, uh, I forgot the name. I just got one of those senior moments. We have come to Mount Zion, but Mount, not Mount, Mount uh, well, well, they got the Ten Commandments anyway. But, yeah, Mount Sinai. Um, and so Mount Sinai was for the law and to teach that they really needed to humble themselves. But we, because we're born again, we came into the heavenly mountain where there's a company of angels. You can see this in the book of Hebrews. A place where we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Someone say amen. So when it says Zion, remember it said we have come into the realm of the spirit to dwell with God. That's what Zion's about. Okay, so to console those who mourn in Zion, that's the Jews who are under the law, and give them beauty for ashes. Who's going to do that? Jesus. And oil for joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called, this is where I got this scripture, that they may be called the trees of what? Righteousness, the planting of the Lord. So when we accept Jesus Christ, it says that Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus was made to be sin for us. That, okay, so we, by accepting him, become his righteousness. That's called the great exchange. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. That's Jesus, okay? And we accept what he did, and we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when it says the trees of righteousness, that's you. That's me. 
We are planted where God plants us. Amen? And if we're planted, we need to grow. Amen? We just don't want to get planted and then die. All right, so we're the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we find out, as we're going to read on later on, in John 15, verse 8, it says that God the Father is glorified that we bear much fruit. Okay, are you with me? All right, so shall you know a tree by how it grows. Did you know how trees grow? Well, we're going to explain it to you. Let me say this. We are like fruit trees. We are to bear much fruit, John 15, 8. A tree grows in four ways. Okay, can you tell me without reading the scripture? Four ways you grow four ways. A tree grows four ways. So depth, height, breadth, and length. Very good. You got it. Give yourself an A. But we're going to go through it. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21, which actually describes it for us. It says for us to be rooted and grounded in love, okay? So in other words, what's the very thing that you hear from a lot of Christians? Oh, I love you, brother. But you know, there's going to come a time where you're really going to be put to the test if you do or not. How many know there's four kinds of love? There is what? Okay, we always go for the God part. There's eros, storge, uh, phileo, and agape. You said agape. Agape is the first one we think of because it's God's love. It's the word that they had to come up with to describe the kind of love God has for us. Unconditional. In other words, he loves us whether we love ourselves or not. He loves us whether we ever accept him or not. His love is unconditional towards us. See, and then we have to believe in him by faith, accept him, and that love becomes a part of our life. As it is written, Romans 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's read Ephesians uh, 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body in heaven and in earth is named, and he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened within with might, excuse me, through the spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you see individually being rooted and grounded in love. Your roots are going down deep, you're grounded, unmoved. You see, Christians need to move in love. Love is God. God is love. So what happens is we don't. Somebody hurts our feelings and we stop loving them. We stop talking with them. We do the whole non-God love thing. And listen, how are we ever going to know God's love and then get filled with God's love and then act out of our own selfish love or limited love? When Jesus said, love your enemies, love those that despitefully use you. The only way you could love someone like that is with a supernatural love, the God that dwells in us. Hello? Because some people, they just live to hurt somebody. So how do you love them? From a distance. <laughs> I'm just, lots of love. It has to be God's supernatural love. So that's the kind of love we want to walk in. Can you say amen? Because if we're walking in God's supernatural love, that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says love doesn't even notice when others do things wrong. Boy, that's a toughie. Because it's one of the first things I notice. When people don't do things right, and they should do things right. Like going to the bank and they count your money wrong. Hello? Going through the drive thrill. Oh, I'll tell you what. You pull off after the drive thrill, better check it. Hello? But you see, we don't look for others wrong, do we? We look for God in each, each other. Say amen, somebody. All right. So being rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18 says, We may be able to comprehend with all the saints... What is, now this is the four ways a tree 
and you grow. What is the width, the length, the depth, and the height? You see it? And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Well, there we go. We, we almost have a contradiction there. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Let me simply say it. To know the love of Christ spiritually, which goes beyond your natural understanding. Hello? So what happens is you believe in God, you, you receive knowledge, you act, uh, you become a doer of it, and the understanding comes by receiving the knowledge and, and acting on the word and understanding by watching the results, God carrying that promise out. And that's what it says right here. It says we goes beyond our natural understanding, but by being with God who is love, we'll have that understanding even though it's beyond natural understanding. Why? It'll be something God imparts to us spiritually and not through the natural wisdom, right? What does it say? Trust in the Lord and lean not to your own. Amen. Because we know sometimes our understanding is pretty limited or we've been taught wrong. We could have some of that. All right, so let's go on. So it goes on and says this. And be filled with all the knowledge of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. According to the power, now listen, that works in us. You see, it's God who is working in you to do his good will and pleasure. While you're receiving trials sometimes outwardly, inwardly, God is working with you. You and God are working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can you say amen? All right, so let's look at how we grow. If we understand tree, we need to understand how it grows and how it produces fruit. So number one, it talks about width. Width is really our integrity and character. How many know for us to be a man of our word or a woman of our word, it has to be God's character working in us to keep our, our, our character. So how are we by ourselves? Are we weak or are we strong? Do we need to be surrounded by others to keep us in check? Now these are just thoughts. I'm not trying to get you to feel bad. But the width there of, that a tree grows in width has to do with integrity its character has to go through all that weather. You got to weather life. You got to be sound. You have to be solid. And everyone say balanced. balanced. You know what balanced is? A little too much of anything could throw you off a of balance. For example, if you think you have arrived and start taking matters in your own hands, which is something that happens when you receive only a little input of the word, but you're doing too many things. So you have more going out than you have coming in. If you have more that you're doing than you have sustaining you coming in, you're out of what? Balance. The Dead Sea is dead because it has all this great stuff coming in, but nothing's going out. Well, we can reverse that. And there could be pro professional students come to church every day, but they don't do anything. They just sit, and sit, and sit, and sit. They don't pray. They don't do anything. And so they become stale, almost like a dead branch. Say, oh, me. But then there are those who get a little bit of good word like this. I mean, this is good word. And when you get good word, you can begin to think more highly than you ought to think. And next thing you know, you're doing things when you still be, when you should be studying. Hello? And we do that. I've done it. You've done it. Amen. And we think it's important. Listen, prettying up your spirit is more important than prettying up your face. Hello. God doesn't want a shiny face if he never sees you in prayer or in Bible study. Moving right along. <laughs> I'll toast to that. I'm the pastor. Yeah. A lot of people say, well, Carrie, how did you get 
to grow so quick and know so much. Every time the church door opens, guess was when the number one guy was there. And because I realized what was coming out is something I needed to hear. Amen. Hey, you might look like doubt warmed over, but if you're on the front chair getting the, getting the word, your life's going to come together. Much better let God put your life together than you try to cover your terrible life with something on the outside. And, the, you know, what does Peter say? It's the adorning of our heart, not the pratting of our, our prettiness and our hair and wearing jewelry and all that kind of stuff. Hello. If you want to get a mate, become a biblical child of God. That's the most attractive thing there is. You know, when, when people get married, the honeymoon's over real quickly. Do you know what you got? <laughs> you should know a tree by the fruit it bears. Hello? Amen. You're going to plant an orchard. Don't plant it with you. Let's move right on. Okay. So, here we go. Whip, so integrity, character. Sound, solid, and balanced. Two, length. Length talks about enduring. Having the tenacity to stay the course. Some people have a victory week. And then the next week will be terrible because they stopped doing everything to gave them victory. It's kind of like trying to push the car and you're trying to, trying to get the car, you know, what do you call that? Jump start or push start in it. You're trying to push start it and it's really hard to initially get it going and then somebody misses the clutch and then you have to do it again and they miss the clutch and you have to do it again. You know, what you never do is stop when you're trying to get a car push started. When you're growing in the Lord, you don't stop, start, stop, start. Hello, you keep going. Hello, especially breaking through those things. All right, so length and deals with endurance, tenacity, stick the course. Third, depth has to do with stability and strength. You grow getting your roots down deep. Okay, because young Christians, they get blown away real quickly. They see something or hear something. They don't really know. Their roots are not deep. He says they become easily offended and are troubled and go away. Satan gets the victory. Amen. Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Somebody can, you know, I've, I've seen them come and go. They'll get a hold of the word. Their life will start coming together and then they start planning their life. Now my life's together. I'm going to plan it for God. Don't do that. You need some depth, maturity, stability, and strength. Can you say amen? And finally, height. That's the only way you're going to get any height. Height deals with spiritual maturity. A person grows in height or, or what we call in the ability to be spiritual when they spend the time they need with God and his word. That's the only way you get it. You don't get that way. When, once in a while, you'll see spiritual accidents. Like I ran into a guy years and years ago. His name was Ronnie Coyne. Now he's gone on to be with the Lord. When he was nine years old, he tripped over a, a stick, fell on a barbed wire fence and gouged out his eye. And so they had to remove the eye out of the socket. So his mom brought, her, brought him to an evangelist, a, a lady evangelist. I don't know who it was. And brought him up on the healing line and said, all she said was, he needs healing in his eye. And so the guy didn't know that he didn't have an eye. So he just prayed that he may see. I don't know who it was. But it was somebody powerful. Because after that, he could see out of that socket where there was no eye. I mean, this testimony, I have a tape of him at my church. And he could read. You could cover up his good eye. And he could get people out of the audience, doesn't matter what it is. And he could read their driver's license and everything. But you see, that's a gift. That's a gift. That, that was a God-given gift. And if you're not careful, that gift... You can take and you can start a ministry on that gift alone, yet know very little about the word. Hello. 
And years and years ago, when people were illiterate, people couldn't read. They only got pieces of the gospel from what they heard. In fact, I remember Kenneth Hagin, he told the story, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> where this one guy read the story and heard the preachers, not read, but he heard the preacher preach the story about Jesus spitting, making clay, and anointing people's eyes. So he decided that he was going to do that. And so his ministry went for years, him spitting and anointing people, whether it be their eyes, their nose, their legs, and they would get healed. The guy had very little understanding of the word until he learned to read. Yet still God used what he knew. If it, that what they know is faith. So that's called a gift of healing. That's actually a gift for the body of Christ. But God rather have us know the word. Rather how, know how to apply the word. And not wait for somebody to stir the waters uh, the angel to come down, stir the waters so somebody could step in and be healed. No, we need to stir the waters by getting into the word. Can you say amen? We also need to understand that there are false prophets, false representatives out there saying they belong to God when they truly don't. In fact, it says over in 1 John chapter 4, it says, try the spirits whether or not they be of God or not. He that believed that Jesus come in the flesh and rose again, this is of God. But he that does not believe that Jesus came in the flesh for the purpose of dying for our sins, rising again from the dead, is not of God. This is the Antichrist or what is it? Something alternative that's not the right Christ. And didn't Jesus say many Christs would come? So we need to have the ability to know the tree what kind of fruit's coming out of it? Amen? All right. Do you know how to discern New Testament teaching? Basically, it's this simple. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. So everything in your life, you need to line up with that. Is it good? Is it perfect? If not, then you need to discern and pray about those things. Hello? If you're unsure, pray. Might be timing. But most people just enter life like some kind of explosion. And we need to have a little wisdom. Can you say amen? If not, say ouch, fire. Okay. So we need the width. We need the length. We need the depth. And we need the height. And we grow in seasons. You notice in a tree, the heart of that tree, there's cores. And each core is for each year of that tree. Outwardly, you should be seasoned. You should be strong. But you should be soft. Can you say amen? Not easily moved because your roots go down deep. Your spirituality is you do what is right whether you feel like it or not. You know, you endure. Why? Because you're not in some kind of dash. You're not in trying to make a name for yourself. No, this is your life you're living. And you want to live it with God so your score is high. Because we have the rest of eternity to be with him. And I'd certainly hate to have you for the first 10,000 years that you're with him. Have to go to school because you were absent from the classes. <laughs> Smile at somebody. My wife up there is smiling. All right. So I'm going to turn the page and let's move on. Are you with me? All right. So my next point is the fruitier, the fruitier, the better. Let's produce ripe, luscious fruit in our lives. In other words, instead of being crabby, be joyous. You know, instead of being concerned all the time, be loving. Instead of watching out, watch for him. Amen. Amen. Otherwise, you'll shake or bake, or cry or fry, or read the book or cook. Hello. Some of those I'll throw out. Okay. So the fruitier, the better. So go with me to John 15, please. Amen. This is the story of I am the vine, you are the branches. A lot of insight in here, okay? And remember, 
What time is this? Well, this is before Jesus died and rose again. So he's, he's explaining New Testament principles in an Old Testament way. Does that make any sense to you? They understood vines and growth. They understood these things because God taught them all. Okay, so Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, ter hear the term? Every branch in me, okay, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. The term is in me. See, he's trying to share with his disciples what's it going to be like when a Christian actually has God in them. And that Christian becomes in God. Remember, we're baptized into Christ, right? So by baptism, we're in Christ. Christ is in us, just so you know by terms. Okay, but can a branch who's in Christ produce bad fruit? Think about it. Can a, can a Christian produce bad fruit? Yes, because you have two fountains. You have the good fruit fountain, you got the bad fruit fountain. You got your spirit, where God lives, and you got your flesh. Okay? A lot of times when you'll be reading in the New Testament, this is for those that are watching, you'll, be, you'll see that do men pick thorns, excuse me, pick grapes from thorns and figs from thistles? What he's describing there is, you're supposed to be producing fruit, but instead people are getting bit anytime you come around you because you're thorny and thistly. We're gospel carriers, can you say amen? But if people can't get by you to hear the gospel, you're too thorny, too fleshy, too thistly. And that's what Jesus is saying here in this fruit. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, because he's in the flesh, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Why? So you'll grow more fruit. Wow. In other words, the neat thing about it is that he's caring for the branches. Hello? He's caring for the branches. Now, let's take the branch. Okay, who are the branches? Okay, let's think of our flesh and our spirit as twigs. Hello, you're a branch and off the, this branch is two twigs. One comes off your flesh, has no fruit in it at all, kind of bitter and nasty looking. And you got the other twig... It's all kinds of little flowers and blooms on it. See, one's coming out of your spirit, man, where God dwells in it. And the other branch is coming out of your flesh. That twig is coming out of your flesh. Well, naturally, what happens? Well, God prunes off the fruit. He, he, he just snips off the, the flesh. So this is actually a positive thing. When I've heard it taught negative, everything in your life if you submit yourself to God like he's the vine dresser and you stay connected to the vine, every branch, the vine dresser, that doesn't produce fruit, he'll just snip it right off of you. So you won't have to worry about that little not telling the truth. Because one day he'll snip it off of you. You keep going to God. Isn't that what it says? It says every branch in me that bears not fruit, he what? He takes away. How many, how many would like God to take away every nasty thing that, that bad habit areas, like for example, like not telling the whole truth, I mean, I, whatever it is. We have little quirks in us. Come on. I'm not saying going doing something, but little quirks. How many one day you wake up and all those things are gone? God says, if you abide in me, he will start trimming the things in your life that produce nothing. That's a good thing. 
You don't want some big old dead branch and somebody meets you for the first time and you whack them with your dead branch. That's a good visual, huh? Some people call it a plank. Hello? All right, so look. And everyone that bears fruit, he prunes. So you bear more fruit. You are already clean, he says, because of the word that I've spoken to you. So he's talking to his disciples. He says, abide in me, and I in you. Now remember, he had not rose again from the dead. There was no concept of them dwelling in God and God dwelling in them. So he's telling, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So now we know we need to hang out with God all the time, don't we? Otherwise, all we'll be able to do is just put on some makeup, dress ourselves, try to make ourselves happy. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. Now he's talking also to those that are not born again. And they are gathered them and throw them into the fire. And they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. See, you got to have the time with God and the time in the word. You will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this my father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. In other words, the word of God will teach and train you. You'll be in boot camp, but you'll know how to fight. A couple of six points I have for you. Number one, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more fruit we will produce, and the production will glorify God. Amen. Two, when we keep away from Jesus in our lifestyle, we wither because the flesh is separated from God. Every branch in me means... We have two kinds of twigs, live ones and dead ones, spirit life, carnal life. Only one produces the fruit God, our Father, really loves. Three, a withered branch comes under that, uh, excuse me, under trial and criticism from others. Remember, somebody is backslidden even gets worse treatment than somebody is just saved. Hello, because they know you tasted of God and now you're worthless they, in their eyes, they think. Okay, we know what's right. So we're miserable because we're not doing it. Huh? We're in the flesh. Amen. So we really can't offer anything good. No fruit. Fourthly, producing fruit is a sign of God's influence in your life. No fruit, no God influence. Right decisions, right motives come from God in us. Fifthly, different kinds of trees are known by the different kind of fruit they produce, each after its own kind. Listen, a pear tree and some apples can be grafted together, but you can't graft a pear tree with a, with a I don't know, a fish. Everything produces in its kind, so apples Different kinds of apples for different, different kinds of apples, different kinds of pears. It can mix with different kinds of pears, pears, but you don't cross them too much. It doesn't work very well. Everything produces after its own kind. Hello. We weren't seeded by some aliens. They were long ago dropping us on planets. No, we were created by God in his likeness and in his image. Can you say amen? All that is just what the Lucifer is uh, trying to sell around. Okay, do we get to point six yet? No, point six. Each of our ministries should produce healthy fruit. Whether we be an evangelist, whether we be a pastor. Let's say we're just a teacher, maybe Sunday school, it doesn't matter. We could be all this, but it should be producing fruit. It should be getting better every week. Why? Because we're spending time with God and he's the vine dresser he cultivates the vines and the branches 
Amen. And you can tell a branch that has really not been with the vine dresser because he's scraggly or she's scraggly. So let's get you with the vine dresser. He's the fixer anyway. It's not Pastor Kerry. All right. So breaking fruit, oh, excuse me, seeking fruit, finding none. All right. Do you know the story? Matthew uh, chapter 3, 1 through 12. Let me read it rather quickly to you. Yes. I'm running out of time, so I want to do this real quick. All right. Yeah, okay. All right, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember Old Testament. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, A voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his path. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair and leather, a belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. And then in Jerusalem and all Judea, all the region round about Judea went out the fame of him. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the religious people, remember, coming to the baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, you snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now listen to the next phrase. Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. What are we? Trees of what? Righteousness. Every branch in me bears fruit, doesn't bear fruit. These are not saved Jewish people. They're mocking John the Baptist. He says, bear fruits with your repentance. But no, the axe is laid at the root of your trees. God is going to cut down the fruit of Israel. Remember the cursing of the fig tree? And switch it to the Gentiles. Because the Jews rejected Jesus, God opened up to the Gentiles. He left the house and went to the sea. Are you with me? And then it says, indeed, I baptize you with water until repentance, but he is coming after me, who's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm unworthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and the fire, whose winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge or clean his threshing floor and gather his wheat, those that are saved, into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff, those that are not saved, with unquenchable fire. Let's see, can we go on? Just one more scripture here. Yes, Jesus loved me. All right. Amen. All right, Matthew 12, 33 through 35 uh, says this. Either make the tree good, get it born again, and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad or its fruit bad. Don't say you're a good tree when everything you produce is bad. Hello. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, again the same bunch of people, can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of your heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good deposit of his heart will bring forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart will bring forth evil things. You will know a man by its, their fruit, right? So you can listen to a person talk. Amen. In fact, sometimes my wife would sneak up on certain people and listen to them talk, not on purpose, and see all this stuff coming out of their mouth. You know, we have church life and we have our life. They should be the same. Can you say amen? Moving past, okay? A good tree has Christ's good intentions. The person has a Christian because they have Jesus in there, their intentions are good. Can you say amen? They have pure motives. They walk with Christ. And Christ is love. Two, a good tree grows out of love for Christ and others. Can you tell me what the two commandments are? 
Love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love your love your neighbor as yourself. Old Testament. Love your neighbor as I love you. Now is New Testament. How I many you know that your old love isn't good enough for some people? But it's not because they don't think it is. It's because it doesn't reach into the areas where it needs to reach. But God's love can. So we love others as God loves us. You see the difference? Moving right along. Students of the word. All right. Third. Okay. Thirdly, don't be thorns or thistles. In other words, stay out of the flesh. You're supposed to represent Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a happy camper. Somebody says, hey, how's it going? Fine. What do you want to know? It. I, hey, I thought you were a Christian. I am. Why do you want to ask? So I'll just give you a silly illustration of that. All right. A bad tree has selfish intentions, is ravenous by nature. They betray one another. Bible says in the last days, relatives will betray relatives. You know, nephews will betray uncles and uncles will get mad at aunts. Who knows? Because people have no loyalty. Hello? It's all surface. Aren't you glad we're connected to the true vine? Amen. Here's some things God hates and we'll break it off here. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Get a chance, read them. Okay, let me go on to this next scripture. Romans 12 teaches us how to behave in the orchard. How many know the orchard's the congregation? And everybody's tree has different fruit on it. It should be all good. Do not bring your problems from home to your church. Take them to your Lord before you come to church. Church is a place to be trained and taught, not to be pampered only. It's not a hospital only. So remember something. Churches are limited because we are limited. So we're not Jesus. So you can't be an answer to everybody's problem, every one of you. Hello. Because some trees are sadly so missing that you don't have enough fruit on your own to give it to them. So you need to encourage them to go to God, let God produce the fruit in their life, and you encourage them along the way. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen.